And we're back again, AP Calc students. Mr. Record here from Avon High School talking about our second example from our optimization topic. And we're going to be looking at finding the smallest distance from a given point to a point on the graph. So if you look kind of right above me, or well, maybe if I move over here, right there, right, you'll kind of see the scenario that we're going to be looking at. Now we're not going to look exactly at this particular graph. But we're going to talk about having some random point, some function f of x, and figuring out what point on that particular graph of f of x would be closest to that given point. And so this is the minimizing distance example. So let me find a good spot for me so I'm kind of out of the way. Uh, this looks pretty good. And if you look right up above, I've got some guidelines that you can follow for solving applied minimum and maximum problems. Now, if you check out the uh, description of the video, you'll find a link that uh, can take you to all of the uh, documents that I use uh, throughout my class. And of course, the notes packet that would cover all of unit five in the course and exam description. And so really what you've got to do is you've got to identify all the given quantities and, and uh, the quantities that you have to determine. And sometimes it's helpful to make a sketch. You're going to write a primary equation. That's going to be the function that you're going to take the derivative of, and you're going to maximize or minimize. And then sometimes you might need the use of a secondary equation. Now, we'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. And then after you figure out the feasible domain of your region, you go to town, you find the maximum minimum by using the techniques that we discussed in previous parts of the course, taking derivatives, finding critical numbers, and all that. All right? So hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of a preview, and we can start looking at our example two. y equals 4 minus x squared. What points on that graph are closest to the point 0, 2? So before anything happens, we've got to figure out what it is that we're trying to maximize or minimize. And so we see this word closest, which is a very charged word in this problem, which means we're trying to find a minimum. So we're going to minimize something, and that something that we're going to minimize is going to be the distance, which I'm just going to call d. Now, when you think about what is this that we're trying to, to really accomplish here? Well, if you were to graph 4 minus x squared, it's not a very difficult thing to graph. In fact, we can put the just a few points together and I can tell you that this is just going to be an upside down parabola. And I'm not saying that graphing this has, you know, any kind of a bearing on you being able to solve the problem. But I just want to get an idea about if the point 0, 02 is given here, what point on this graph is going to be closest to 0, 02? And what I'm hoping more than anything is that you start to see what tool that we have to use. What equation, what formula will equate distance to the situation? And that particular formula will be the distance between two points. So hopefully you know or are familiar with that formula that goes a little something like this. Distance is the oh, difference of the x values squared plus the difference of y values squared all under a square root, right? It's basically an adaptation of the Pythagorean theorem. Now, the problem with this distance formula is that it is icky. That's right. You can say that. It's a math word. It's icky. It's a very difficult thing to take a derivative of. In fact, it has like 27 letters of the alphabet in it or close, right? So we want to make sure that we know that we are certainly allowed and encouraged to use our fixed point 0, 2. And we can use that as either one of our ordered pairs. And so what I might suggest is that we throw 0, 2 in for the x2, y2 spots. Now the x1, y1 is certainly going to be variable, right? It's going to be some point that lies on this graph. And so we can keep those variables intact. But at this point, I don't even think that there's any need 
to use subscripts because there's only one X and there's only one Y. And so these would comprise our binomial expressions that we will square and then add and then, of course, take the square root of. And so that gets the ball rolling. That's going to serve as our primary equation. But if you watch the last video, you learned that if you have a primary equation that consists of x's and y's, that's no good because it's really complicated to take those derivatives. And so we have to come up with what I call a constraint equation or the secondary equation, which I'm just going to abbreviate. And a secondary equation oftentimes uses a number. It's some kind of a value given in the problem. Or sometimes the secondary equation is so clear that it just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks. And all the secondary equation is is some way to equate y with x. And you have to look no further than the equation of this parabola, y equal 4 minus x squared. That is your secondary equation. That is the stuff that you're going to plug in for the y. And so if we do that, I'm going to kind of clean this up at the same time. And I have just square root of x squared so far. But this y, as I said, is going to change into 4 minus x squared minus 2 quantity squared. And so we're sitting on this right now. And we are in a better position to take the derivative. But I didn't say best position to take the derivative because this is a pretty nasty derivative. And there's a lot of, oh, options, I guess, at least three that I can think of. Some teachers might just have you get rid of the square root because maximizing or minimizing this D expression with or without the square root still yields the same results. But sometimes that's kind of difficult to understand why that's true. So what I'm going to suggest is do something else to get rid of the square root to make the derivative easier to take. And that would be to square both sides. Now, if we do that, we of course would have d squared on the left. And then on the right side, the entire square root expression, or the square root, I should say, disappears. And all we have is what's underneath the square root expression. Now, as I do that, if you don't mind terribly, I'm going to expand out this 2 minus x squared, right? When I combine the 4 minus 2, I'm going to think about this thing right here as being squared out. And I would get 4 minus 4x squared plus x to the fourth. Now, if you're bothered by that, you could pause the video, maybe work through that a little bit more slowly and catch that. But all that is is just an Algebra 1 technique. And then we can go ahead and maybe combine a couple of like terms. I'm going to choose to write this in descending order to make it look a little prettier. And so I would have something along those lines. And so you guys, I think I'm ready now to take a look at this derivative. So let's do it. So if we take the derivative with respect to x, we would get 2d times the derivative of d with respect to x, right? We have to take this derivative implicitly. x is the independent variable. So 2d d, d, dx is what we have on the left side. And then the right side would just be 4x cubed minus 6x. Pretty easy stuff there. Now, you're not completely finished with this derivative until you can get the dd, I'm sorry, the dd dx all by itself. And so to make that happen, we're going to divide over the 2d. Now, if I divide over the 2, I can just decrease these coefficients by a factor of 2. So I'm dividing out a 2. And then when I divide over the d, instead of putting a d in the bottom, how about I just put the square root of? what we just had, x squared plus, and maybe I can do a more simplified version, 2 minus x squared quantity squared. 
for the time being. And that's a derivative, you guys. Now, to keep moving on with this problem, I am going to now suggest that we find our critical numbers, right? And so I'm going to get rid of this little orange thing because I'm not going to need it anymore. That space might be kind of helpful to have. And so I'm going to figure out when is the derivative of d with respect to x or d prime equal to zero. And so that can be obtained by setting this numerator equal to zero, which can be found by simply factoring out an x and then solving what's left. And you would get x equaling 0, of course. And then I think you're going to get x squared being 3 over 2, which is just going to equate to x being plus or minus the square root of 3 over 2. And that's when the derivative is equal to 0. Now you also have to entertain the thought of when is the derivative undefined because that's also going to yield critical values. Now, if you take a good lo long look at this thing and you, you kind of consider, okay, when is this thing ever going to be equal to zero? If you just use a little bit of number intuition, you're going to notice that the only way, the only way that this expression can ever be zero is if this piece right here could somehow be negative x squared to cancel out this positive x squared. But how on earth are we going to get something that's negative after we square it, right? So therefore, it's going to be impossible to come up with any extra critical values for the derivative being undefined. So we're just going to go with these three critical numbers, 0 and plus or minus radical 3 over 2. And so at this point, you can either use the first derivative test or you can use the second derivative test to verify which is your correct answer. Now, if you checked out video number one of this series, you notice that I used the second derivative test because it was really easy to take the second derivative of that v function that I had. But in this particular case, as ugly as this derivative of d with respect is, I don't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. There's none of us that wants to take that derivative. So we're going to rely on the second derivative test, or the first derivative test in this case. And so we put 0 on our number line. We put negative root 3 over 2 on our number line. And we put positive root 3 over 2 on our number line. And we're going to look for the sine of d prime. And so we're going to test numbers like to the left of negative root 3 over 2. Something like, um, oh, negative 2 would be pretty safe. So if we plug negative 2 in for this derivative expression, 2 times negative 2 cubed would be negative 16, I believe, right? Minus 3 times negative 2 is going to be plus 6. And then the bottom, you don't have to work really hard at because the bottom is always positive, right? I mean, how can the square root of something ever spit out a negative answer? So on this interval, you have negative 10 over something positive. So that means you're going to be negative. We move on to the next interval, at which point we can use, say, negative 1. Remember back here, I used negative 2 as my test value. So if I plug in negative 1, I end up with negative 2 plus 3 over something that's guaranteed to be positive, which gives me a positive result on that interval. Next interval over, I'm going to test positive 1. Positive 1 is going to give me 2 minus 3 over something that's definitely positive. Right? Positive 2 minus 3. Let's get that negative out of the way. So 2 minus 3. And so this, of course, is going to be negative. It looks like the signs are just alternating. You never want to just assume that. So we're going to go ahead and keep thinking through this. 2 times 2 cubed is 2 times 8, or positive 16. Minus 3 times 2 is 6, of course. And at this stage, I would get positive 10 over a positive, which is positive. So yes, the signs do alternate. But we're interested in finding the relative 
minimum, right? Because of the word closest. So a minimum is found whenever our derivative changes from a negative to a positive, and that happens twice here. <clears throat> so when it asks what points on this graph are going to be closest to the point 0, 2, if I move myself out of the way here, those are going to be the points when the x is the square root of 3 over 2 or opposite of square root of 3 over 2. And so we'll say the points closest to our given point 0, 2 are the following order pairs. Negative root 3 halves, comma, something and positive root 3 over 2, comma something. Now, it sounds like we have a little bit more to do. Yeah, we do need to find the y value for each of these, but it's not nearly as difficult as you might think because your function y equal 4 minus x squared just needs to be evaluated at each of those. And if you square, the square root of 3 halves, you're just going to get 3 halves, and 4 minus 3 halves would be 5 halves, 8 halves minus 3 halves. And the beautiful thing is, we get the same result, don't we? Whether we plug in the positive or the negative root 3. And so we have our answer. If you want to look at this a little bit more intently graphically, I don't really know where to tell you <laughs> where to find the square root of 3 over 2. I don't know what the square root of 1.5 is, but I do know that 5 halves is 2 and a half, which would be right about, oh, let's say uh, in this area here. And so those two points are the two that are closest to that point. And if you look at this from a graphical standpoint, that does certainly seem feasible. It certainly is true that there would be two of these. And both of these distances, both of these d's, are certainly going to be a little bit shorter than the distance if we used the given x value of 0, which was actually another critical value. Interestingly enough, that turns out to be a relative maximum. Relative maximum. Not overall absolute maximum, because we could certainly find a point elsewhere that has even a farther distance still than from the point zero 0.02 up to the point zero 0.04. So anyhow, I hope this helps a little bit with a, a little bit more tricky problem that involves a, a bit more yucky looking algebra, but you're well on your way to really discovering more optimization problems, perhaps appreciating them a little bit more, because it's certainly one of the most powerful applications of differential calculus. Stick around the next video. You've already seen a, a bit of a preview, but we're going to take a look at example three here at the bottom of the page in video three. Anyhow, hope this helps. We'll see you next time.